Welcome back to Mothcast. As usual, uh, I'm Bruce, and with me is Luca. And first off, I wanted to quickly just wrap up on our last two shows: the um, fifteen thousand dollar Aussie, no, fifteen thousand dollar Aussie twenty thousand US challenge. Uh, the other way around. Really, fifteen thousand dollar US, twenty thousand dollar Aussie, but close. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. That. <laughs> what, That's what, challenge. What, what Luca said. Um. Good, very, very interesting response. But I think what's the response that surprised me the most, Luca, is people are actually starting to do it. Yeah, there's a few boats that have been sold as a consequence of the, um, of maybe the show, hopefully. I don't know. I think it's a good thing for the class. If people can think outside the box and um, try to make their sailing lower cost, I think it's a good thing for everyone. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, it's, it's not the, you don't have to spend twenty thousand dollars Aussie to get into a moth class. Um, as some comments might have suggested, that's not the case. What we're saying is that that'll get you a very competitive boat. But you can probably um, get a pretty decent boat for about twelve thousand dollars Aussie. I think that's probably the, the the starting range for the Mark IIs and that'll get you um, in, into a very good boat. A lot of the guys that I coach have those sort of boats. You know, they have twelve thousand dollar Mark IIs and at the moment while they're practicing how to, you know, jive and learn how to tack and all that sort of stuff, boat's not the difference. They don't need a twenty thousand dollar moth, so that's more if you have aspirations to get better and, and win some races at some stage. What? what what's what's winning? What what is winning a race? Can you please explain this for me? Winning a race at at some significant regatta. So with that sort of twenty thousand dollar boat, you could probably look. Can you win a race at the worlds? Mm, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. But certainly um, with that sort of a boat, you should be able to win. Um, probably a nationals race in most countries except for potentially the ones that have the Olympic gold medalists in it. No, I think you're missing my point. What is what is this word win? I don't understand. It's not something I've ever done. <laughs> sure, you would have won a race at some stage. Nope. Really? Never. You've never won a race anyway? Nope. Club race with like three people to... to uh, no, I, actually, no, I stand corrected. One, as far at hand in Sabos in my first season when I was really? just doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fun thing. Not everyone could... Like, at any race, any one person can win, Luca. It's not about winning. It's about having no, fun. of course. But it's much better to... You have far more fun if you win. <laughs> sure you do. <laughs> so I think I'm just joking, of course. What, what I found particularly interesting, um, though, is that is some of the general messages that we got through Instagram and through Facebook um, of literally people saying, hey, I'm doing the challenge, I've got this Mark II, or hey, I'm doing this challenge, I've got this stuff out of Dave Lister's garage, um, and which is now going to become a whole, uh, whole separate project in, I think, what they're calling the, the, the Pomstro. Um, so that I think in and of itself will be particularly in- interesting. So we had a very similar message um, come through from um, a good friend of ours who used to race at our sailing club, um, Tazzy Ian Coxall, and I'll just read it out. Um, so, and by the way, we love this. We love people that write in with ideas for the show. So if you want to do it, hit us up. Mostly the- because we don't have any good ideas. Well, we have lots of good ideas, but are they all really um, either A, YouTube worthy? That's not B, the com- conversation we just had 10 minutes ago. No, I don't, I don't, <laughs> or, no, 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 let me finish. <laughs> no, are, are, they, are they relevant to moth sailing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so... Anyway, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Sorry to interrupt, but I think it's a, it's a good one for the show, so... No, no, it's, um, what I was going to say, though, um, definitely hit us up, either on the moth, on the moth cast Instagram account, um, comments down below... Um, if stuff you want us to talk about, um, just you know, just just reach out. Okay, so um, Tazzy, uh, aka Andrew Coxall, reach, reaches out and he says, "Hi, idea for a show. You could talk about all the latest innovations: deck sweeper, lower rigs, higher wings, bowsprit, aero kits, foils with flush flaps, um, flushing toilets, um, canting rigs, bent booms, etc. How each of them make a difference and how to get the most out of them, which make the difference and which are not required." Um, yeah, go. I think I think in terms of making the difference, I think it's you know fairly um, fairly straightforward. I think it's in the foils and it's in the rigs. You know that's where the biggest gains are going to be in terms of percentage gains for your money. Yep. So spend money on good foils, spend the money on good rigs. You know that includes obviously the mast and the, and the boom um, that works with the sail that it's been designed for. So it's it's a package obviously. Uh, but that's, that's kind of where show. most of the speed is. And that's the show. Thanks <coughs> that's for the show. Thanks for joining Mothcast. But we're not going to talk about necessarily where you should spend your money because it's fairly straightforward where that is, um, I believe anyway. But what we will talk about is, is where is this, this all heading? Like where is the class 
heading in terms of development. Obviously, all these things are changing. The deck sweepers in particular, which we'll discuss in a second, um, are ever evolving thing. And the latest generation of the sales is um, changed the initial concept of the deck sweeper as well. Um, but yeah, you know, let's go for the list, Bruce. And first question really comes up, um, and I'm. On this, on, on, my, on my laptop, I, I do have some models. I'm going to do something, a show around doing a bit of CFD around looking at that in the future. Um, so s subscribe to watch out for that one in the future. Um, the deck sweeper. So I suppose the the, uh, the question I have, well, I, I know the answer, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Um, wh why is the qu why is the deck sweeper a must have? And if so, what makes the deck sweeper more efficient? Um, than a traditional sale. So for example, let's contrast the A5M from Lennon with the A5M deck sweeper. Which it's actually quite a good why. test because we've got a fair bit of experience with those sales and, and in some aspects, the A5M full sale is better, you know, like downwind. It's actually a faster sale in all conditions downwind than the um, deck sweeper version. But I think, um, look, I think it's really two things. It's it's uh, lowering the center of effort of the sale is probably the biggest gain. Yeah. If you can cut the mass down or have a shorter mass that's you know 250 mil long, uh, lower, um, <coughs> lowering that center of effort gives you more power of the boat. Um, so that's where the big gain is. And then there's smaller gains in other areas. And I would say that there's probably two big areas where the gains mm -hmm. are. One is that you have um, a, a, a more aerodynamic transition of wind over the van, the Cunningham ropes, all that messy stuff, the lever itself. It just, the deck sweeper does streamline and it ultimately fares in that fairly messy and turbulent area. Um, so that's one benefit. Um, how much of a sail is the deck, deck sweeper part of the sail? Depends on which sail model. The latest North sails have done a fairly good attempt at uh, making the deck sweeper an actual sail with a, with a proper curve in it. Um, as some a, of the early ones were batons, just a fairing and battens going around yeah. yeah and some of the early ones were purely just a fairing there was no sail shape to it it was just to fear the, um, the 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 draggy components of the boat part of the rigging um, so like the Vang the Vang the Cunningham ropes yep, yep. the lever um, even the drag on the back of the mast stump or the back of the mast yeah yeah, yeah. so you know round tubes going through the air are actually very draggy um, you know, statistically, and it's, some people might find it interesting, but it's a, a foil shape of the same um, thickness is uh, 24 times less drag than a, than a round tube, let's say, of the same thickness. So, okay, so, okay. so, so, so to be clear, let me understand. So what you're talking about is a foil shape, <coughs> like, like, for example, a, a taser mast. Yeah, for the those are airfoil, or, or, teardrop, or a teardrop traditional cut off, yeah. a key, yeah. teardrop cut off, yeah, twenty four times less drag. So, um, so there's round tubes going through the air, which is our stumps in particular, are very bad. Um, so by being able to fear the the back of that tube with the sail material is there's a little gain in there. Although what's interesting, a round circle leaned over. Is elliptical. elliptical, which is better. Which is absolutely better. better. Yeah, and an ellipse is far better than a round um, circle going through the air in, in profile. Um, but the last thing that there's also a big gain um, is what's been happening with the latest generation of the deck sweeper, which is to, to seal on the deck and have the end plate effect. And that's where the big gains are to be had, and this is where the development is heading in my mind, where you know deck sealing will eliminate the the spill of air that happens underneath the sail if you're looking at the sail if, if you imagine the boat sailing to windward you know leaning towards the wind the the air is traveling kind of down the sail and spilling under the boom so to be able to deck seal the bottom of the sail um, gives you a increase in, um, in in power essentially and, and reduction in drag so you end up with a more efficient sail design I think th there's also a big difference though upwind and downwind though as well. I think because downwind typically you're always hunting for power, whereas upwind you're generally trying to get rid of power. Yeah. So I think the traditional higher rigs are definitely probably have more powerful downwind. Yeah, much more. Whereas yeah. the, um, the the deck sweeper rigs are more efficient upwind. So I think then it becomes a trade off of the fastest way around the course. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and and it's been proven, we know now, that the deck sweeper will be faster around the course. Yes, it will be slower downwind. 
Um, not so much through the um, speed through the water. You know, you'll probably hit similar speeds, but it's just depth. So somebody with a full size 50, 300 mast with a big full Lennon A5M will always go lower than somebody that might have the A5 MDS. So you might be five degrees higher and obviously going further distance. So, but yeah, but in, in, pure, in pure terms of maths, right, you're, if you think about a, a classic windward lured, just simply because of, even if you sail the same, you won't, but even if you say we're sailing the same track up and downwind, you're going faster downwind, therefore you spend less time downwind, therefore yeah. you want to optimise for upwind. For upwind, absolutely, absolutely. That's where the gains, most of the gains are. And also, not, not to mention that you, you are strategically better placed if you can round the top mark first and kind of clear the fleet. Then you've got first look at the breeze. Um, if you can be fast off the start line, you know, you don't want to be slow upwind and you're fighting for clear wind on the way to the top mark. You're going to be mid-fleet. Yep. Okay. So, deck sweeper, tick. Definitely, deck sweeper tick. definitely a gain. Yeah. Right around the course, um, you know, if you had to get one one sail and only one sail, particularly if you're down on the lighter side, deck sweeper. Deck sweeper. And it depends what length mast deck sweeper. There's obviously different length masts. How extreme do you go? Um, but quickly before we move away from the deck sweeper, is just I think it's important to sort of maybe just quickly touch on where this is heading. And what we've seen is the latest generation of deck sweepers where that deck sweeping part is just growing. It's getting bigger and bigger. The latest generation of the North variant uh, of the deck sweeping sail uh, that Rob Greenarch headed the New South Wales uh, Mott States is 150 mil bigger in the deck sweeping bit. So the bridles as a consequence are starting to come back. Um, I think uh, they're definitely going to try bigger again. Um, perhaps another 150 mil further back again. It'll get to the point where the limiting factor is going to be the sailor being able to fit through behind the sail, right? Um, because the yeah. bigger the deck sweeper, the bigger the end plate effect is because you can seal a bigger area. What, what about the length of the rear wing bars? This feels like an area where the beaker actually may start to become compromised. Absolutely. And, and, there's, and there's two things. So the, the boom length first is actually going to be reducing from now on because if you end up with a bigger sail area down the bottom you don't need a long footed sail anymore to make up this area area so the booms are getting shorter so pull out your boom from four years ago that you thought was going to be binned and you can actually use it again um but Luca, yeah i'm actually running the same boom and so am i <laughs> the back in fashion again but i never threw it away uh, but yeah look it, so the booms are getting shorter with the sail area coming uh, being p proportionally positioned down lower. Um, but yeah, wing bar, as you touched, you know, because by being able to um, have a bigger deck sweeper or bigger end plate effect, um, you'll be limited by where your re wing bar is. If it's a long way forward, like on the beaker, you will struggle to get through the boat. And, and you might end up having to have a sail that has a smaller deck sweeping bit as a consequence. Um, I don't know what the ultimate combination is maybe having too much deck sweeping area is too much of a loss of power because all that area is so low you're not getting the power into the rig anymore maybe the downwind will be really slow yep. um, but I have a feeling it won't be I have a feeling that certainly as a upper range sail and again you know we might be in a two sail territory again um, in the future you will want to have just a really efficient low center of effort sail with a big end plate effect as your heavy wind sail yep. So I think that's, to be honest, that's where I think the, the really big gain is, is in, the, in the deck sweeper. Um, lowering rigs sort of goes part and parcel with the, with deck, the deck sweeper. With the deck sweeping. Yeah. So yeah. you have to go lower if you want to go on the yeah. deck sweeper. I think when it comes to the right height rig for if you weren't running a deck sweeper sail, a traditional sail, it comes down to body weight. Absolutely. Body absolutely. Weight What's right for, yeah, absolutely. Body weight. So there's not really, a, you know, if, if it works for you. And also uh, platform as well, because different boats have different height stumps, which affect the, uh, the tr and all triangulation and also the height of the mast, the length of the mast. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so low rigs. Um, aero kits. Yeah, look, Tom Slingsby had a fairly elaborate um, aero kit on his um, Exocet of the World, uh, which was built mostly by, I think, Reese. Telby did a lot of the um, computer work and Marty Johnson did a lot of the um, 
fabrication work, uh, which really fed in the rear wing bar more than anything else into quite a nice profile elliptical shape. And again, now we talked about this, you know, uh, gain of having an elliptical shape going through the air instead of a, a circular shape going through the air. So fairings definitely make a difference. Um, how much difference? Probably not a whole heap of difference, but they do make some small difference. I wouldn't go and necessarily error your complete boat until you have the ability to fall take around the course and yeah. so in, minimize. In terms of percentage gain, um, it's going to be very, very minimal. Yes. Yeah. Minimal. Um, and, and more so when it's light, of course. So, error kits, yeah, maybe, generally not. Also, don't build something hard to run into. Um, flush flaps. On foils. Yes, not flushing flaps on toilets. No. And I think what Tez is talking about is, is cleaning up some of the losses around um, the cutouts for the flap going up on the vertical. I think that's probably what he's... Or maybe, or is it, or, or is sure it about the tips, um, the tips, tips losses? I'm not sure if that's referring to which ones it's referring to, but yeah, absolutely, that's massive gains in the sort of things because oh, look, under if the you, water. If you, if you don't have to adjust your foil at all in rake or angle, of course. It's oh, there's there's, there's ways of doing it. You know, the the, the new Maguire um, foil that came out had a fairly um, not a bad attempt at at cleaning the junction between the flap. Um, you know, the flap going up and, and, and the vertical so you don't have the big cutout on the vertical, yep. um, which was dealt with by having quite a large bulb and all that was kind of hidden inside the bulb, yep. which was quite a neat way of doing it. Um, downside of that is you end up with a higher bulb area, which re- increases your drag, um, surface friction drag. So that's the downside. So I think it's an improvement over perhaps what we've seen before. Yep, yep. I don't think it's the ultimate. Um, I think that the uh, Manta solution is probably a, a better one, um, but it's a difficult one to execute um, structurally. It's it's there's a lot that needs to go on, and the complexity of the foils obviously will will you know get higher, which will then push the costs up and reliability and all sorts of issues. So I think that one's still to be uh, worked on. I think it's got a lot of potential, but uh, it's got to be done um, reliably. Uh, otherwise, uh, unless he's talking about the flat, fixed flaps, uh, which we can touch on as well, um, fixed tips. You know, I, I don't know if that's part of the question, but but from my point of view, there's always compromises in design, and fixing the tips reduces the tip vortex a little bit, yep. end up with a slightly uh, more efficient fall going through the water. Uh, the downside is that you lose some control as a consequence, and it all really depends what you're designing to. So for me, the Swift Large has a fixed tip because you can sacrifice some control on a fall that's designed to work in under 12 knots anyway. Nobody's going to be flying out in eight knots of breeze and yep. crashing everywhere. Um, so, but for a heavy wind foil, I don't think you want to necessarily reduce the control unless you're sailing flat water. Maybe you're very experienced and you can get away with it more than somebody that's fairly new to the class or maybe somebody that's not a great boat handler. So that really comes down to like, what, where do you sit with your skills? And, um, but in terms of gains, you know, uh, from my experience, I haven't found that to be super significant. I've tested foils with both fixed flaps and not fixed flaps um, and found that you can barely tell when you're sailing uh, the foils. Same foil, of, you know, not a lot of difference because we don't, tip vortex is not that big an issue. Uh, for us at yep. the angles of attack our foils operate at and lucky last um, on the question from Tazzy is um, canning rigs now, can- yeah the canning rigs so this is interesting I, I, I can answer this one quite easily how many people actually in the fleet run canning gear now I know the, a lot of the, the exosets do or can I know there were, around Sorrento there was a massive flourish to put levers on to control canning rigs and all that sort of stuff um but i think what was really interesting is there's a video that mike lennon did um a few years back and in that yeah. video what mike basically showed was when you run can over a certain angle then basically the vang pulls down and essentially makes the can useless from a mechanical point of view so there's a very fine window where canting is possible and i think as a reality well it increases what, your your 
when a main sheet loads. Yeah. I think there, there was the, so it's not useless in terms of aerodynamics. It's more that it makes the boat more difficult to sail. Well, yeah, exactly. But I think the point that I was going to make was that I think what most people have done instead is realised if they just run a slack rig, then running a slacker rig gives a lot of the effect without the complexity of the canning gear. Um, and there was a phase when everyone was running super slack rigs to try and get the canning effect to happen um, as opposed to running canting gear. But, uh, you know, I, it's sort of gone out of fashion, particularly from a putting it on, having the complexity, having it run, you know, the gains. I think most people think the gains aren't there. I'm sure if you're at the front of the fleet and you really know what you're doing, there is a sweet spot where it will definitely work. Well, this is, I think, critical. Where is this sweet spot? And I think um, with the canting rigs, when does it work? When you want to increase power of the rig, so you are essentially underpowered in seven knots of breeze, eight knots of breeze, maybe nine knots of breeze, yeah. um, you're looking for more power. So having a rig that's canted away from you will give you a, a bigger projected area because it's not, you know. Yeah. So um, so you get, you, you get some extra power, which is handy downwind, and it's handy outwind. But as soon as you reach 12 knots, we're starting to get overpowered. Um, and a lot of us get overpowered a lot earlier than 12 knots as well. You know, I think I, I probably get overpowered in 11 knots and I'm a big guy. Um, so as soon as you're getting overpowered, you kind of just want to flatten off the sail. You really just don't want any cant anymore because that's just increasing the power in your rig. So um, that's when it starts to not pay off so much. And... Uh, the question is, do you need to have this very complex system on your boat that increases weight and potential of things breaking for a window of maybe seven to 10 knots of, of real benefit and potentially some downwind? That's, the, the do we still the, out on the downwind? The short answer is no. Uh, for me, it's not, but then some other guys um, and girls love it, you know? So, But I don't think it's a clear-cut sort of an answer. I think... It works for some people. I don't think it's a must. Um, I don't see a massive gain in it so that I feel that I have to put it on my boat to can, be competitive. Can I, can, I, can I put a hypothesis that say to, can I put it in a hypothesis to say that if you actually truly don't understand where the benefits from canting will come, there's no point putting it on your boat because you wouldn't know how to sail with it anyway around the course. Yeah, and also when it's very light, you know, when you're trying to get on foils, it can make the platform unstable. It can make your manoeuvres a little bit more difficult because you might, after the tech, not get the full power after, you know, you've gone through the turn. There's a little delay as the rig cans away from you. So there's so there's also slight so problems I think, with both so handling. I think what this... Jiving is awkward, you so know, jiving is very I think what this has just awkward. done is sort of made me realise is that I think with anything, any updated or mole at all, there's a sweet spot and the and, and there's a simple rule of thumb and that is if you understand where the gain is and if you need that gain then by all means put it on but if you're not sure why something is faster or how it will make you quicker then don't do it keep the boat as simple as possible focus on boat handling because that's where the, the the gains will come absolutely if, if you look at the um and you know we watched the sale gp on sydney harbour the other week and um you know the gains were really just Picking the breeze, staying in pressure, pulling off tacks and being on foils more than anybody else and all that sort of stuff. And and, and that's where the kind of the big game was. Well, I watched the St. George Club race a, few, a week, a few weeks ago. You did back, too. Yeah. Which was, um, apart from the two at the front, every piece, every place on that racetrack was coming to came down through boat handling. So. Yeah, yeah. And in that breeze, and, you know, Bruce referring to a fairly strong um, subtly that we had, dead flat water, and you could actually, you know, it was 20 to 25 knots, but you could actually just pull foil in text if you got it right. Because um, the, the boat was, you know, not getting jolted around by the waves. So you could actually, if you timed your turn, you could actually pull a foil in tech, which, you know, I know for myself, I can't do that in waves. But if it's flat water, I've got some chance of doing it. So hopefully, Tazzy, that answers your question. Um, deck sweeper, yes. Lower rigs, yes, as a consequence of the deck sweeper. Aero kits, flush flash, flaps, canning rigs, um, tea caddies, drink bottles. No. Leave them. Leave them. Leave them. Leave them.